Welcome to Central Christian Church, where we are worshiping today in the heart of the heartland, Anderson, Indiana. We're glad that you're with us today, and we will be studying about the kingdom of God, looking into each parable as we are doing these few weeks, and uh, discussing what it means to be a citizen of the kingdom. We'll have some wonderful music, our chancel choir, our handbell choir, uh, some other things that will make the uh, worship uh, enjoyable, but also a beautiful gift to God. And we will also be celebrating at the table. And so if you would like to celebrate with us, gather some uh, elements of communion, whatever you have that will work at home to represent the bread and the cup so that you can worship with us. If you've got a prayer request today, we would gladly pray for you for any and all needs that you would send us. We are happy to do that for those of you who have sent us your needs from all over the world. Uh, my email address is on the bottom there, and our website is also there where you can learn all about us and all about the Christian Church Disciples of Christ internationally. We would love to hear from you if you've got anything to say. We're glad you're worshiping with us today. And I hope wherever you are, you are safe and good and well. Welcome to Central Christian Church. So, the kingdom. The kingdom of God is something that the people that Jesus came to, and us, were sometimes confused about. What is the kingdom of God? Jesus came to a group of people that thought they understood precisely what the kingdom of God was. The church, after all, had described it, had refined it, had created this image of what the church uh, was, and what God, who God was, and what the kingdom of God was. And so Jesus stepped into a place where the paradigm was different than what God had intended. 
He stepped into a place where people thought that the kingdom was a place on earth, was land surrounded by boundaries, that it was, to be more, more specific, going to be ushered by, in by their nation, that their nation would become a superpower, that their nation would be ruled by a human who would be anointed by God to be the king, to, to roust out all enemies, and furthermore, to roust out all non-Jews. And either, depending on what prophet you read, either eliminate them, chain them up, or bring them to the truth of Yahweh. And so it was a physical kingdom that they were looking for. And, and Jesus spent almost all of his time teaching about the kingdom. The way that he did it, the method that he used, was parabolic. He used parables, something that was, um, that was useful to make person's mind work and think and work it out for themselves. So he would use a parable because it was the historic way that all rabbis taught, and he used it because it was a very Jewish way of teaching. The, the Jews seemed to like to find a, a point. They liked a story to come to the point, as opposed to the Greeks, who liked argument for argument's sake. And so it was very difficult sometimes when the two would meet together in a first century church. But Jesus taught in kind of both ways. Uh, for every spiritual truth, there is a physical metaphor. And so, just as Paul said, uh, all of nature kind of resounds with the truth of the invisible world. Jesus used a lot of nature examples, a lot of growing examples, and used parables to tell us about the kingdom. Now, parables are different than allegories. In an allegory, every single thing in the story represents something. Allegories are meant to be read and studied and poured over. Parables are said at the drop of a hat, and they give us one point. So each of these parables teaches us one thing about the kingdom, and only one thing. Jesus sometimes explained them to his disciples, or, I would argue, sometimes the parable meant something different to his disciples than it did to the people that he was teaching. Um, and so he did that sometimes, or he didn't. Sometimes he gave the parable and let the people who listened, those who have ears, decipher what that meant as he continued to teach about the kingdom. And because a picture is worth a thousand words, uh, you can get a lot out of a simple two-sentence parable. Um, in any case, Jesus started his whole teaching uh, with a very important word, metanoia. And metanoia is sometimes translated in English as repent, which is too bad because repent is, means something totally different than metanoia does. Repent, uh, the background of why that's the translation is a little more complex, but basically it's, a, it's from a Latin root, not the, not the uh, Hebrew or Greek root. And it means, repent means to look back, feel badly about what you've done. But metanoia means to look forward, but in a different way. Metanoia literally means change your mind, change the way you're thinking, turn around, go the other way, totally redefine your paradigm. And the reason that's important is because Jesus started his teachings about the kingdom using that word, metanoia. Think a different way. You have to because you're thinking about the kingdom all wrong. And so you need your mind to be renewed, to be changed. Think differently. This parable that we're talking about today, the parable sometimes called the parable of, of growing, um, is only found in the book of Mark. Uh, Mark uh, may have been written before the book of Matthew, but more than likely, uh, Matthew is the one that had most of the sayings of Jesus. A lot of the book of Mark is word for word, letter for letter, copied in Matthew and Luke. And Matthew uh, turned, may have turned from a book of sayings to a book of sayings with action. Mark didn't have a lot of sayings of Jesus. It had more of the action of Jesus. And so there's, there's less of the parables, but this is one parable that only shows up in the book of Mark. 
Um, Mark has this parable uh, situated with all the other growing parables. Uh, he situates it chronologically uh, at Capernaum where Jesus is teaching. Um, in fact, it's the time uh, where he, there were so many people there and so big crowds that he got into a boat and kind of got out into the water and let the water help acoustically and also gave him some distance uh, so he could see everybody. The kingdom of God is, in this parable, the kingdom or news of the kingdom, is planted. And this parable, in this parable, the farmer sows the seed. And in this parable, like a couple of other planting parables, sowing parables, we are the farmer. Uh, there was one parable, remember, where Jesus said specifically in this parable, God is the farmer and the seeds are people. But in this parable, we are the farmer and the seed is the kingdom of God or news of the kingdom of God. So what have we learned prior about us being the farmers? Well, the first thing we learned is it is our responsibility solely to plant the seed. Our responsibility is solely to plant the seed. It is not to judge the soil on which the seed falls. Any farmer will tell you they don't get a 100% return. Every seed they plant does not bring to full blossoming a plant. But, so you sow generously. And that's one of the parables. There's going to be hard soil. There's going to be rocky soil. There's going to be soil that has weeds. And some soil is going to be good. Yours is not the problem, as he told his disciples, as to the, the soil, except when it concerns your own heart in receiving the seed. But as sowers of the seed, your job is to sow the seed. It's not to worry about who's going to accept it and who's not going to accept it. That's not part of the deal. Our responsibility is to sow the seed, he says in another parable, and not worry about the weeds. Shall we pull the weeds? No, says God, the farmer in that parable, he says no, because you have neither the means nor the authority to recognize what is weed and what is wheat. Let them grow together, and I, the Lord of the harvest, will sort it out after. In other words, just assume everybody's wheat, or as Jesus says very clearly, love one another as I have loved you. Ours is also to be responsible for the planting, but not the harvesting. That is the Lord of the harvest. So, simply said, if we're planting the news of the kingdom of God or the kingdom of God, our job is to plant. That's it. Our job is to plant. Now, this kingdom parable is a kingdom of planting. And it says the farmer puts the seed out it's, uh, it, the whole parable is spoken in, in present tense. The farmer puts the seed out and doesn't even know how it happens. But somehow, the seed grows. He's done his job, in part. Just wait. He's done his job. We don't know how God does it, but the seed grows. We don't know how the kingdom of God expands. But it does, because that's God's job. And our job is to plant the seed. This is a kingdom parable of planting. It's also a kingdom parable of patience. Uh, this is sometimes called the parable of the kingdom parable about patience. The immediate hearing of this with uh, the people that Jesus was speaking to, remind yourself, remember, that Jesus is present on earth during a very hot political time. There was a lot, especially in Galilee, there was a lot of trouble with people getting very tired of the Romans um, living, uh, living with them and actually ruling them. They were tired of living under the thumb of Rome. Rome cost them a lot of money. Uh, Rome, um, 
really took charge of their lives, and the Romans were not Jews. And so a lot of things went against the way uh, a Jewish person would want to live or be. Um, They were very impatient when it looked like Jesus might be the answer to their prayers, might be the Messiah that they believed would come. In fact, a human person who would sit on the throne of David and get rid of all the Romans, they were impatient to know when that was going to happen. When is the kingdom that we imagine going to happen? Jesus is constantly telling those people, and especially in this parable, when he speaks it, they would have probably heard, you need to be patient. It's not yours to do anything but plant the seed. Patience. The king, our father, will harvest when it's time. And the kingdom may not come in the way you imagined. As a parable to the disciples, this is about where the seeds are going and will they produce a plant, which once again, Jesus reminds them, it will. But that's not really your job. Your job is to sow the seed. Sometimes that does not get immediate results. We probably all remember as kids getting seeds and planting them and going out the next day to see if something happened. Well, it it doesn't happen that quickly. However, it will happen. And our job is to plant. It is a kingdom parable about planting. It's a kingdom parable about patience. It's a kingdom parable about growth. We can't make it happen. We can't make growth happen. Uh, That's not something we do. Uh, My kids, your kids, they don't grow because we stand over them and yell at them to get bigger. They grow, and this is important, especially in this parable, they grow because we give them everything they need to grow. We nourish them. We make sure they're in the right environment. Only God can make things grow, and that's faith. But growth is inevitable, and we have the power to inhibit or encourage. Growth in the kingdom of God, if the seed is sown, growth is inevitable in good soil. We can do nothing about it. It's mysterious. It will happen, but we have the power to inhibit it, and we have the power to encourage it. Jesus uses pictures to teach about the kingdom, uses these kind of pictures, because they're agrarian, and, and these folks grew. They, they understood growth to a point. Um, they knew they may not be able to force the seed to grow, but they knew they could prep the soil. They knew they could water the seed. They knew they could make certain that the plant gets enough sun. Or... They could neglect all of that. They could not water. They could not make sure it gets enough sun. They could not They could decide not to prep the soil. Either way, something is going to happen if it's in good soil. So to measure growth, as we are reminded in this parable, growth comes in stages. And sometimes it happens in intervals, not moments. And so it may be that you look for growth after a while. And when you go back in stages, I'm a a grandparent, and I don't see my grandkids every day, and I still see them pretty frequently, but every time I do, they're, they're different. They've changed. They've grown. They've learned something new. They're into something new. Now, if I watch them every day, I might not see that progress as much as I do when I see them during segments of life. With with a with a plant, uh, you know you're going to see uh, a seed to sprout to a leaf to a bud to an ear to the harvest. You're going to see that, but it's going to happen in a time period that may not be what you expect. In the kingdom of God, however, growth is inevitable when the seed is in good soil. It is inevitable. We can't always perceive that the kingdom of God is constantly 
and inevitably growing. But it is. We can see that if we look not in decades, maybe sometimes in decades, but certainly in centuries. We can see that the kingdom of God is more alive. If you have the ears and the eyes of Jesus, you can see that the kingdom of God is more prevalent now than it was a hundred years ago and 200 years ago and a thousand years ago. How can you tell that? Because you can see people doing the will of God, which leads us to the next and final question of or reminder that we need to have. What is the kingdom? The kingdom is doing the will of God. Remember, we talked about that first off. Definition of the kingdom is in two sentences in the Lord's Prayer. Two sentences that define each other. Thy kingdom come, which means thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven is the definition of the kingdom of God. And so, when the will of God is done, that person is a citizen of the kingdom. If we look with the right eyes that are not distracted by what the world would show us, we can see, if we check in intervals, the growth of the kingdom slowly and surely, and we know in our hearts that it's inevitable. Have you ever watched a weed pop up through concrete. You know how strong growth is and can be and how inevitable it would be. There is a parallel universe that is larger and more real than the universe that we see with our human eyes, than the people that are walking around with us. There may be some weeds and there may be some wheat. We don't know. We treat everybody like wheat because our job is simply to plant. But if we look, we see that there is something more than what we just experience with our physical senses. There is a world that transcends time. People who did the will of God were part of the kingdom of God. People who are doing the will of God are part of the kingdom of God. And someday the whole world will do the will of God. And that's in the future. It's past, present, future. It transcends boundaries. It transcends borders. It transcends nationalities. It transcends gender, ethnicities, social, economic. It, it, it transcends everything. It is not of this world. It is from another place. And it is not confined to the definitions of a kingdom in this world. From this parable... We learn, once again, the confirmation that our job is to plant. It's not to harvest. It's not to weed. It's not even to be impatient. It is to plant the seed, to make sure that the soil is good, to make sure, if it's our soil, that the soil is good. Other than that, it's none of our business. We just plant the seed and make sure that we are not hindering the growth of that seed. Growth is mysterious, and it is through God alone that things, especially the kingdom of God, do grow. Once the seed has been planted, once the seed, which is the kingdom of God, has been planted, growth is guaranteed. It is inevitable. It is ours to watch and once again, make sure we encourage, encourage the growth and not inhibit the growth. We can see growth if we look in large intervals. It's kind of like watching the stock market. Every day, eh, it's going to go up and down. But when you start to look at larger intervals, when you start to look at a year, you start to look at 10 years, you can see really the movement. And the same is true for the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is certainly, as Jesus says, at hand. It is within us and it is in our midst. It was and it will be. It transcends time. It transcends place. And when you say to Jesus, I will accept that life that you're giving, that zoe, 
He's saying you can have it now. You don't have to wait. You can have it now. And when you experience that extravagant, embarrassingly extravagant is the translation in the Greek, embarrassingly extravagant life, life to the full, as it says in English, then you realize that that's the kingdom. That thing inside of you, that that voice, that heartbeat, that breath of Jesus inside that transcends every pain you feel, every trouble you go through, and we will have trouble. We'll sometimes have more trouble than people who don't believe. But none of that actually matters in the long run. It's painful. We have to acknowledge it. We have to deal with it. But our lives are not determined by flesh and blood. Our lives, our real lives, our true lives, our kingdom lives, live forever and far beyond anything that will happen to this shell that houses our lives. The kingdom of God certainly is at hand. And when you have something that wonderful, and as our last parable said, when you've sold everything you have because you realize how valuable this is, how beautiful it is, like the pearl, then you can hardly help but scatter seed about it. People will notice. People will wonder. Our job is to sow the seed and encourage growth. That's the kingdom of God. is a type of parable. It's a parable that we act out, but it's a parable in that it compares one thing to another, something we can look at objectively and place it in something that we might not understand clearly to get a better understanding of it. Jesus wants to give us his life. He says over and over again, my father and I want to live in you. We want to be present in you. 
And so he somewhat symbolically and also very, very real uh, gave up his physical life for us so that he could show us that he was giving up his life to us. Not just giving it up, but giving it to us. His life, his body, and his blood, which back in Jesus' day when he walked the earth, blood was the sign of life. No blood, no life. If it was coursing through him, he wants it to course through us. And so we meet at a very simple parable. It's a table, something that Hopefully, most of us do at least once a a day and sometimes three times a day or more. But we sit down and we eat, we consume. And the basics of the meal are are liquid, are are the cup and bread, which, of course, again, in Jesus' day and in societies all over the world is the basis for most meals. And so here we learn that we are to remember what Jesus did and consume all that he is. On the night that he celebrated the Passover with his disciples, their families, and their children, he stood at the place of the Father, uh, where the Father would stand at a Passover meal. And as he did, everyone was silent and stood with him. Nobody sat yet. And he prayed the prayer of blessing over the bread, which symbolized the entire meal. And he blessed the bread, broke the bread, the flat bread, which would be the plate for the rest of the meal, handed that around to those at the table. And then he said, this is my body given to you. Take this, all of you, and eat it. And we do. He did the same thing with a cup. There were four cups of blessing, four cups of wine at the Passover. One of them he took and he blessed and he said, this is not just the blood of the grape, but it is my blood. And I want it to course through your bodies. Take this, all of you drink it, and we do. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, you are gracious, and you are merciful, and you are wonderful to call us to this place, this place that is a house and a home, a place that has a table where we sit as family. We sit with people we love and people we know, and we sit with strangers. But Father, we are all bound together by one name, And that's your name. As we look into what it means to be a citizen of this invisible kingdom, this parallel universe, help us to have the eyes of your son, Jesus, to see people as they truly are. And help us to see the world as it truly is, as see the kingdom as it slowly grows. Father, we are thankful for the breath of your son, the Holy Spirit, that not only leads us into all truth, but comforts us but embraces us, empowers us, fills in the cracks of our weakness, and binds us together. We are thankful for the spirit that helps us to love each other as your son has loved us. So we pray that you will hear our requests, that you will hear our heart's requests, that you will wrap your arms around us, protect us, walk with us as we become the church outside of the doors of the sanctuary. Help us to realize truth when we see it and not be so narrow-minded as to think that the only truth is found in certain areas. Help us to realize that every bit of creation holds your thumbprint and every bit of what we see is a picture of something that is invisible. Help us to realize that your truth and your love and your power is broader than the scope of our imaginations. We thank you for the scripture that leads us to you. We thank you for the spirit that, according to the scripture, leads us into all truth on and off the page of scripture. And we thank you for your son, Jesus, who taught us what the kingdom was. And he taught us to say this prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. 